constantly going through security exercises. These are good, good American fighting people. And we're very proud of them. The trick is making sure they're proud of what they do. You know, I mentioned the airmen. I'm trying to explain to them that now you're not targeting against Canadian hordes. You're actually doing something that's more meaningful than that. You're talking to these very, very intelligent lieutenants and captains who could be doing a lot of different things. <clears throat> Americans are free choice. Why would they want to be a nuclear missile leader? It's especially troubling when we hear words out of Washington, D.C. that say things like we want to minimize the role of nuclear weapons in national security strategy. Well, of course we do. But we need to make sure that's translated properly to these young Americans who could go off and do other things with their lives and make sure that they understand as long as we have one nuclear weapon, we've got to have the very, very best people involved. You know, not just they, but uh, our security forces, our, our maintenance uh, personnel, uh, some of our EOD, uh, CE troops, go through a very, very uh, uh, intense screening process. You're almost all aware of it called the Personnel Reliability Program. And that's sort of a cheese cloth to make sure that only do the best and brightest get to serve in this career field. And that when they have anything that happens that changes the force of their brain so that they're not completely into their work, then we pull them for a period of time until they're back in the game. Extremely important program to assure America and its Congress that only the best are out there. Next slide. So this is what a launch facility looks like up here on the top left-hand corner. Harden facility and uh, has a support building that allows that uh, missile to constantly receive power and air conditioning, even at a remote facility. It has a 110-ton concrete blast door on top to protect it, along with shock isolators, so if there were a nearby blast or detonation, it wouldn't completely destroy the missile, it would probably allow the missile to continue to be able to launch. It normally receives commercial power, just like uh, houses in the area, and if that commercial power were to fail, it has something called a Minuteman power processor, an MPP, it's constantly sampling that power to make sure it's good and clean. And if it's not, it shuts it off and immediately switches over to battery power. And it continues sampling that commercial power to see if it's back. If it's not, it starts cranking up the diesel engine, the tertiary system, to get energy to it. And once that diesel is up and running and producing the right kind of power, that MPP can then switch it over and keep that site going. So we're not draining battery. Similar system for our launch control center that you see depicted down there on the bottom left hand side of the screen. Here's the missile alert facility. You see the elevator shaft that takes you down approximately 60 feet to the Harden Launch Control Center. It's shaped like a great big underground barbell. And inside that barbell is something that looks like a small box car and huge shock isolators about this big around. Again, to allow that crew to continue doing their launch actions if there were a nearby detonation. Vibrate the heck out of them, but they should be able to live long enough to get key turn. Something about the Minuteman 3's weapon system, when I talked about its uh, resiliency and being a hardened target, is this idea of interlacing and in, uh, redundant uh, communications. These sites are all lashed together within each squadron with hardened under, underground intersite cable systems. These are pressurized cables to ensure that each launch facility, and that is the silo where the missile is, and each launch control center where that two-person crew is are interconnected with multiple hex lines, hardened intercable, hard, hardened intersite cable system, to make sure if we lose any portion of it, what's left can still interact and get the mission done, launch the missiles. It's a very resilient system, uh, very, very well designed. We do have one thing that's a challenge here at Malmstrom. As the years have gone by, creek beds have shifted. Uh, and we've gotten a lot more water in uh, some previous years than I think the designers accounted for. And so we do have a lot of these Hicks lines that we have to constantly go out and monitor and make sure they're buried. And if they're spread across the creek bed, that we reroute them and uh, make sure that they remain buried. But, uh, let's say a farmer drags a plow across the field and cuts one. Uh, a pressure alarm goes off at the only launch control center so that team can respond and send those aggressive, heavily armed young airmen out there to take care of whatever's wrong, make sure it's not a hostile act. Next slide. This is our complex. You see the grayed out area. That was the 564th Missile Squadron. It's now inactivated. 
But you see the 12th Missile Squadron uh, over here to the eastern side of the complex. There's Malmstrom. And, uh, excuse me, on the western side of the complex. Those are the red dogs. In the middle of the complex, we have the 10th Missile Squadron. That's the first ACES. Uh, Alpha 6, by the way, is where hopefully all of you will get to go on Saturday to see where the first missile went on alert. Uh, first Minuteman 3 ever on alert. This all happened to occur during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then what we call the Eastern Front, all the way out here past Lewistown, is the 490th, and we call it the Far 90th, and they're the far side. And you can see the size of that complex. But uh, I think just as important and just as compelling, across that area, the size of the state of Indiana, you have 417 people constantly out there, somewhere around 400, but generally around 417, either maintaining, preparing, or operating that weapon system. That's not very many people over a whole lot of area. Next slide, please. And you can see the size of the complex. Go ahead and build this for me if you could. Those are our sister missile wings. They fit inside Malmstrom's complex. Malmstrom was the first complex built, and so as they put it in, very quickly, by the way, because of the nature of the, the political climate at the time, uh, they encountered a lot rougher terrain than what you have at Minot and Epi Warren, which is both relatively flat. Here we have a lot of silos that are literally placed right inside of mountains. And you go out with these guys in a payload transporter hauling a re-entry vehicle or a bomb up to these sites. It makes you stop and think for a second when you're going up an old craggy road uh, toward that silo that's sitting on the side of the hillside. Uh, so very, very talented uh, young airmen and sergeants that, that do that job. And you can see the size of these complexes off to the side. Um, and one of the lessons that were learned as they were constructing the Malmstrom complex were in place with F.E. Warren and Minot. So their silos are a little more modernized. Uh, they're uh, somewhat more resilient, but we're catching up. And uh, we are spending uh, some money to try to make sure that our sites compensate for groundwater seepage, those sorts of things that really weren't thought of too much when they were being built. Next slide. So when we have somebody from headquarters, uh, Global Strike Command, and particularly the bomber types, uh, we like to let them know that our, our flight line is literally the same size as if you were to drive from Barksdale to Dallas-Fort Worth. And I like to especially point that out to those well-meaning staffers that ask me, why do you guys need a traffic control center at Malmstrom when we don't have one at Barksdale or Minot uh, on the bomb lane? And so to me, that's very compelling. I like this picture. When I get somebody in from Washington, D.C., I really like the next slide. Our complex is as big as if you were driving from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia. Next slide. Well, our Malmstrom airmen don't just pull nuclear alert. They're constantly being deployed. We're also home to an air combat command tenant unit called Red Horse. Extremely proud of these people. Uh, these are the equivalent of Navy CDs. Uh, they build air, uh, airfields in combat conditions. But that's not all they do. I mean, they literally could do anything. You give them the right tool, they will do it. A tough bunch of hombres, and uh, having them co-located with us at Malmstrom allows us to leverage some capability when they're not deployed, and they help us with numerous projects. Uh, we just did some fantastic work in our weapons storage area here on base that needed to be done for, I would say, decades. And we finally have an area big enough now for our huge payload transporters to more comfortably maneuver in and out of that facility, thanks to our Red Horse unit. They're getting ready to deploy here this month, and uh, they're going to work on some projects in Israel. Next slide. Right now, we have 42 folks out. That number will grow up dramatically when Red Horse deploys. Next slide. We also have some other uh, very unique capabilities from Malmstrom Air Force Base that we're especially proud of. Our EOD folks, these are literally heroes. I mean, these guys have deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, several of them have uh, offered their lives up. Uh, uh, thankfully, we've gotten all of our EOD people back, but uh, definitely in harm's way. And on a day-to-day -day basis, we get calls from people all over the state of Montana and surrounding areas where Grandpa had a German potato masher from World War II that the kids found in the garage, and our EOD gets to go out and try to disable it. Uh, in addition, they uh, just got back from Yellowstone a few weeks ago where they had to uh, 
uh, go up and get rid of some ordnance and mountainsides that were being used to uh, uh, try to uh, keep avalanches uh, from occurring. So uh, very, very busy unit, very, very good bunch of people who absolutely love what they're doing. I hope you actually run into a few of our EOD troops before you do. Our law enforcement working dogs, you don't really think about dogs all that much, but I'll tell you, it's been eye-opening being the vice commander here and seeing how much these dogs are used. And we value them just as we value our airmen. Uh, they are fellow airmen. And uh, anytime the president moves, the vice president moves, mounts from Air Force Base, gets a call because there are so few of these working dogs available. And they get to deploy to Southwest Asia as well. We also have the uh, nuclear uh, biological chemical detection capability here and emergency management. So we would have the ability, not just if we had an incident here at Malmstrom with our uh, uh, weapons, but if, say, EOD were moving, or a uh, Department of Energy were moving a ship through this area and had an accident, we could be first on scene and provide some command and control while other federal agencies came in to support us. And then finally, I'd like to highlight our helicopter rescue squad. As I mentioned, their mission has shifted over uh, to be focused on security of our missile field. But they still rescue people here in numbers that are unheard of at our sister wings just because of our terrain. Uh, we have a lot more hikers, hunters, and uh, fishermen in this area, uh, and we get called upon constantly to go out and perform rescues. And uh, they were the, the best search and rescue uh, helicopter squadron in, in the uh, Global Strike Command last year. Very proud of them. Next slide. These are some of our accolades. I, I don't like to stay on this slide too long because uh, everything is transient, but uh, we're working hard to be the very best there is. Next slide. This is our community. Uh, all totaled up, we have just about 8,000 people on this base when you count our families, and I think we must count our families. Uh, very, very young, and that's the thing I like to point out on this slide. Given the mission I've just talked to you about, think about the fact 52% of our officers are under 25 years old, 77% of our enlisted force are airmen, and 63% of enlisted, excuse me, 53% of the enlisted are under 25 years old. I mean, to me, they look like kids. And, uh, it, but I feel very safe. And going back to the idea of deterrence, uh, we know from Russian inspectors that that scares the hell out of them. You know, it's not just the bombs and the missiles and the ability to reach out and touch them, but it's the idea that we put a three striker out there doing something that it would take a major or lieutenant colonel to do in Russia, that's got a real chilling effect on their, uh, on their military hierarchy. We're Americans. Next slide. These are the dollar figures. Uh, this base is exceptionally important to the Great Falls area. We provide just under 50% of the local economy. So when we talk about the idea of sequestration and possibly eliminating ICBMs, or, or when we talk about uh, an ICBM wing going away, um, that, that is viewed very negatively here in this area. And it has people on edge. And, uh, you know, and, and I would say that when you're out in the community as a member of Malmstrom, especially if you're senior, that's the very first thing they want to know. What do you know? Is the base going to be there? And um, so that's, uh, that's why. You know, not only are these people extremely patriotic here in this area, I mean, I have never been to a base where the local community has just enveloped us and made us part of the, the community like, like here at Great Falls. I know there are other great uh, atmospheres out there across the Air Force, but I personally have never experienced anything even close to this. And uh, so um, you know, I'm just as concerned as they are. Next slide. These are some other things we do that I think are even more important than the money when it comes down to it. Uh, our airmen are in with and under people of Great Falls in, in all kinds of volunteer work, constantly visible out there, doing the right thing when nobody's looking. Yes, we have bad eggs, everyone's got bad eggs, and we police them up fairly quickly once we get them identified. But by and large, our airmen make us proud. Next slide. This is our chain of command. You see Colonel Brule there at the top, and uh, we've got a brand new command chief, Frank Padani, fantastic guy, just came in from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, he is a uh, former cop and uh, former operator, space operator. 
you can see Mark Zimmerhansel here. He's commander of the Red Horse uh, unit. And you see he's a full bird colonel because of the nature of what they do and the size of that unit. And then you can see our group commanders across the bottom from left to right. We have our operations group commander, Mark Schuler, maintenance group commander, an old friend of mine, uh, Dave Blizner, an old friend of mine, Angela Stouts, our mission support group commander. Dave Lynch just came into us this summer as our security forces group commander. Came in the Air Force in 1976, by the way. And then uh, Bruce Green is our med group commander, and he is known across the Air Force as a guy who fixes things in the medical world. And uh, so we've got an A team. I couldn't be happier with this group of people for excellent. Okay, well, I've grown on long enough. I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Yes, sir.